graphic design things do. Uh, imagine in, in I, I, I love the idea that the audience here is coming from lots of different disciplines. I understand some of you are in graphics, some of you are interiors, some in architecture, some perhaps in engineering. And in my mind, the way, the way to make things work is to have everything speak with one voice. And imagine uh, if IBM used this as their corporate logo. It wouldn't quite communicate what I think they're all, they're all about. And uh, it, little things like graphic design uh, play a big role in, cust in customer perception. And with the way government regulation is going, uh, it will be probably uh, li likely that certain brands will have to be just generic or not be able to say anything. Imagine trying to be the brand manager for, for Marlboro's or Camel's if this is all you could do. How do you differentiate? So graphics actually plays um, a big role in life by what we wear. Uh, when you go in consciously or unconsciously and you're buying something, whether it's a t-shirt or it's, it's a suit, uh, you're, you're in essence branding yourself one way, one way or the other. I also think that the gra th th these, these kinds of signs are very powerful. I, I, I think of this when I'm driving as a command. And so I immediately stop and, it's like, and, 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 and eat. But there's something about truth and, truth and advertising. And this, uh, th these kinds of things, I think, are wonderful. And when you have a choice of how do I design a, a communication, a command, uh, a uh, aspiration, the, the, the way one uses and combines graphics in the presentation is, is really hard. And uh, there's been lots of things done with taking something, you know, right, it used to be that advertising budgets were divided between 30 second television spots and, and print ads. Now the money is all over the place. It's in point of sale, it's in direct marketing, it's, it's online, it's all sorts of ways of doing it. But if you have a shopping bag and, so, and you're walking down Fifth Avenue in New York, it's a great billboard. So people have done wonderful things with shopping bags. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, a bookstore, I think, in, in, in uh, Holland. But it's, it's fun. Or this, this is, for, if you it may not be politically correct, but uh, <laughs> it, it, it kind of works. Uh, you know, there's been major anti-smoking campaigns uh, in, 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 Belgium, in Belgium, Holland, Germany. And, and some of the graphics that have come out have been absolutely uh, extraordinary. I, I think the, you know, the same thing. So, you know, it's, it's clever. You're seeing more and more um, guerrilla marketing going on out there now. And uh, I think that, that as designers, some of the best stuff that one sees around the world is, is these little bits of guerrilla marketing that, that crop up. I really think they're, they're, they're wonderful. Um, they're, they're inspiring. And I think that uh, uh, some of you doing graphics probably read print magazine. And uh, I, I love print because they always are taking young designers and putting something up there. And the one on the left, which you can't see, is called Change, and the one on the right is Unity. And it's just a, a very simple little graphic, but it's very, very effective, I think. I, I like that. And this is a, uh, a, a designer who decided there's another way to do tattoos. I thought this was really innovative. Uh, you, you know, usually the tattoos all form, uh, you know, designed by the Hells Angels or something. But uh, this is, here's a, here's a graphic designer's approach uh, to, to the world of tattoos. As I say, in advertising, there's lots of wonderful things because you, you, you can be fairly freeform and while there's a lot of analytics that goes into advertising, uh, at the end of the day, somebody has to be creative and come up with something. So I thought that was a pretty good ad for, pretty good ad for Raid. It really, really works, with them. that works. Or, uh, <laughs> these things, these things. I've, I've, 
I, I've never been accused of being politically correct. So my, my apologies. Uh, I think this was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. So there's, you know, there's a lot of clever right brain stuff going on out there. And you can apply this to, to, to sort of whatever, whatever you're doing. Uh, for a bread, this is like the bread, Albany bread. Uh, good. Well, some of these, these are, this is uh, California. How many of you are from California? Any of you from California? Because uh, I mean, California is the best place in, in, the, in the Western United States. Uh, because they have all these gigantic, everything's gigantic out there. And uh, they, this is the kind of billboards they're doing now. I think it's fun. Uh, not bad for us hot, spicy ketchup. The, the, the idea, if you notice, most of these things are done with great simplicity. It's a one, one idea done exceptionally well. And it's so much better to do one thing well than try to cram 10 things into a message. If you can communicate one thing very, very well, that usually carries the day. And with technology, and this is early technology, uh, this was a series of billboards in London uh, that were, in essence, interactive. So when you walk down the street and you passed under that, it made you smart. And you're seeing more and more of this sort of thing happening. That, that's where the technology is becoming a, a marvelously creative um, adjunct to, to the toolbox that one has to, uh, to, to create innovative design. Well, this for a, you know a window cleaner for it's getting a little bleached out here. It's a goldfish with a crash helmet and a fishbowl, but, but it's for a glass cleaner. This to me has been one of my favorite bits of of uh, a sort of guerrilla marketing. Uh, this is on a bus in I think in Holland uh, for a watch company. It was just so clever because it's things you see every day, the straps hanging and whatnot. Uh, how do you use that for uh, 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 an advertising marketing purpose? Uh, I love that. And then in the area of retail design, where I've focused most of my energies, uh, it's an interesting part of the design process. I didn't set out to do retail design early on in, in my career. Uh, when, I got, when I got out of school, uh, I worked for a very prestigious architectural firm for a year, and they fired me, uh, and that was my last job. So I started very early, and what I did was anything I could do, whether it was graphics or packaging or somebody's uh, kitchen or bathroom or whatever. I just wanted to design. And so we'd, you know, we would do uh, uh, anything out there, and we would fall into retail design, and I found that it was a wonderful um, uh, area of open expression because the criteria for design, while you have a cash register at the end of the day that has to ring or your design has failed, there's no criteria for it. It's not like doing a hospital or a lab where, where you have so many restrictions in terms of rules and regulations of what you can and can't do. And it can involve graphics, it can involve industrial design, it can involve architecture, interiors. So it took into play for me all the things that I like to do. And it didn't have eight foot high ceilings, which uh, when I was doing some corporate interiors, I didn't really relish. So for me, it became a very nice outlet. And the firm that I founded was, was called Walker Group and then Walker Group CNI attracted just wonderfully creative people, some of whom uh, had a graphics background, some studied interiors, some were MBAs, some were architects. And uh, we worked in a very, very collaborative way. And that's why an audience like this I find interesting. And at uh, CCS, that I'm, I'm uh, uh, proud to be a little part of, uh, I like the interdisciplinary opportunities that are there as, there as well. And Shopping is very visceral. When all of you travel, you do two things. You eat and you shop and sightsee. But uh, the shopping part, I, I think when they get to the end of the genome product, genome project, uh, uh, they're going to find that you have a shopping gene in you. 
and then we're going to alter it somehow or rather you can be a luxury or you could go down market or something like that but I'm sure we'll find a way to engineer it but it really is part of our psyche and it's part of what we like to do when we're out there uh, bouncing around and it's very competitive it's competitive on, on all levels and uh, never more so than, than really right now in an economy like we're having and when you go into a shopping center or mall or you go down the high street, uh, everybody's trying to pull you in. And each, each person is either you know, trying to present, present merchandise to you better or offerings better. And so much of it, uh, unfortunately, is, is price driven. And this would probably be the ideal store for a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, retailers. But what happens is it gets over, overwhelmed by um, promotion. And to a lot of people, this is retailing. You know, just, just get it out there, get the price out. But the real innovators, the ones that will be around for a long time, know how to go uh, well beyond it. But what happens is we're all used to clues. And you see a sign like this that says $4.99, and then you see another sign like this that says only $4.99, and this is the much better value. So we're trained, we're trained to think in these, in these uh, graphic, graphic terms. But uh, you can't lose sight of that because it really is part of the retail experience. And the problem with most retailers is like the, the Yam lady that I showed you before, they all copy each other. If you're uh, if you are in the shoe business and somebody opens a new shoe store, you go out to see what they've done. Or in the cosmetic business, they're all looking over each other's shoulders to try to see if there's some new way of doing things. And if you're an architect or designer and you're asked to do a store, uh, like we worked for the last two years with Telstra in Australia, which is a telephone a wireless company. And what they've been doing in the past is simply going out, seeing what the competition was doing, and do it in a different color. Uh, you, don't, you don't advance w w with that. And so with, with everything looking the same, innovation becomes uh, almost a requirement to succeed now. You, you, ten years ago, you didn't hear people talk about innovation the way they do now. And still today, people don't really understand how to do it, save for uh, a handful of companies like Google and, and Apple uh, that, that really know how to, know how to in innovate. And what the idea is to do is that you have to differentiate yourself one way or another from everybody sort of looking the same. So that's my last politically incorrect slide. The, uh, but this is part of the process, is how do you take something and, and add value to it whether real or perceived. But this is Starbucks, in a way. Why do you buy, why do you spend you know, two ninety five for a Starbucks coffee when you can get a cup of coffee for a dollar fifty? And part of it is that perceived value and the experience of going to a Starbucks, whether one likes Starbucks today or not, it's been successful because it transformed itself from just a coffee shop to what they used to call the third place. And it is done with certain amenities, but it is really all about perception and the value that one is getting for uh, what, you, what you see. And I think that we're very accustomed to uh, having visual pres presentation done for us when you go in a department store, and it's a good department store, and it makes you walk around it chances are the reason you're walking around and circulating is when you're standing here and you look there, you see something and it's lit. It may be a, a group of mannequins. And when you get to that point, if you look that way, you might see something that draws you to it. And I think that, that we're used to visual presentation as being uh, part and parcel of the, of the retail experience. And the clues for that, again, are all around us. My favorite bits of visual presentation are things like the bazaar in Istanbul or the, the floating markets in Bangkok where the markets have been there for hundreds and hundreds of years and in this case the spice sellers you know, really know what they're doing, really know how to present their wares exceptionally well. And that's a better place to look for clues than what your competitor is doing 
uh, around the corner. And we've tried in some ways uh, to learn from that and be able to translate that into a, a modern environment that, that, that we, would, we would design. And I think these are some examples of uh, what I think are pretty good uh, visual presentations as stores, or stores as visual presentations. Uh, this is the, the, the vitamin uh, water store in the UK. And um, M&M's has done this, uh, and, and others, uh, really quite well in terms of taking a product and making it into uh, the maximum visual presentation environment that you can do. Automobiles, to me, have always been uh, a, a, a source of, of inspiration. I probably really wanted to be uh, an automotive, automotive designer uh, and have d done a little bit, but really was never very good on those, playing with those silicon graphic machines. I could never learn how to do it. And so I, I didn't go that route. But auto, automobiles are ubiquitous. They're all around us. We see things. We're impressed by them. Uh, you know why people like something like this, this uh, Ferrari. Uh, the home, you know, the do, do it yourself guy can sort of create his own branded environment this way. And you know, one of the things that annoys me in, in automotive design is that we're making green cars, but nobody knows they're green cars. This is a green car. This, you, know, you know where this person stands, at least, uh, as, as being uh, pro-environment. But it's sort, of, it's sort of funny, because they, um, uh, when I look at the cars that are supposedly green, there's no vocabulary yet that's been devised for showing that you're a green car. You know, there's badges and names. But there's nothing that immediately tells you that. And I sort of like vehicles where you kind of know what the person looks like who's driving this. And you can, you can imagine this guy probably has a tattoo or two or something like that. But uh, I think the way the automotive industry is going, it won't be very long before you can order your Buick Skylark uh, with flames on the hood. Because I think we're going to be getting into mass customization uh, more and more. But I think the automobile has a tremendous influence uh, on what we do. It's a, it's a source of pride. Next to our home, it's usually the second biggest purchase that we have. And people love to, um, to customize them and, and make it part of their, uh, their brand. Uh, your cell phone, in essence, is probably the most personal item that you own. Uh, no two people in this room have the same things on their, on their cell phone, I would doubt. And uh, so there's that need to sort of distinguish yourself. And, and what you wear and what you drive are two ways of, of, of doing that. And the, the automobile has also influenced a lot of you know, what roadside America is all about. And especially out west, where you have these big open spaces. You see these, you know, in, in incredible things: dinosaurs, uh, you know, four-story high tire salesmen, and I love this stuff. And uh, uh, you know, this, luckily, uh, in Los Angeles, which I'm sure most of you have seen pictures of, if not seen the real thing, uh, acquired landmark status in, in in downtown LA and has been preserved. And there's lots of things like this around the country. Lucy, do any of you know Lucy the elephant in Margate, New Jersey? Has anybody seen that? It's a great elephant that's been landmarked. So there's lots of things like that. But they have, they affect architects you know, in a very pronounced way. And this won a, a, a number of design awards last year. There's a fast food stop, I think it's in Kansas uh, in Oklahoma. And it's just terrific. And it's in that spirit of these, these giant roadside America signs and, and statues that you see. And it's, uh, it's, it's really beautifully done. And uh, so very rightly so, it won a host of AIA awards uh, last year. One of the things that I always like about doing a presentation like today, I get to show things that we did that we loved that never got built. And I could have a four, four or five hour slideshow on that. But uh, this is something that we did here in Detroit as the guinea pig. And uh, a friend of mine 
ended up buying A and W, and A and W had a hundred-year history, and it was really pretty good. But this, their roadside presence was next to nothing, and we started to to try to think of what this could be. And when you think of a restaurant, um, a, a McDonald's or anything like that, what it really is, it's a billboard, it's a three-dimensional billboard on the highway. Uh, and it happens to hold people and food and whatnot. But the whole presence is that of a, of a sign, a billboard, etc. So we started to experiment uh, with A&W, and we came up with all kinds of uh, provocative ways of, of maybe creating a, a totally different branded image. And these were some of the early, um, early studies that we did. I kind of liked this one. Uh, that was the, the, but what we ended up doing was we realized that this building had to have a presence during the day and a different presence at night, or, 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 or as, as impactful a presence at night. And we, we developed this idea of, a, of a, a modern sort of glass building that um, uh, you know, had a lot, of, a lot of presence during the day, differentiated itself from the others, but at night, also was still, was still the billboard. It had one sort of slight problem. It cost about five times what the budget was. So it never did see, it never did see the light of day. But I show this to everybody because I want to build this one day. So the, the, the store that I think uh, probably uh, symbolizes the best of retail today, and, and I mean that uh, across the board, uh, from department stores to specialty stores, is what Apple has done. And it looks very simple, but the, the power of Apple is, very, is really, um, it is simple in that everything it does speaks with one voice. The architecture, the product, the set training of the salespeople, the graphics, the advertising, uh, it all speaks with one voice, and that's very much top-down. That's, that's uh, Steve Jobs' m mantra and John Ivey's mantra. And a handful of companies have within their ranks what I call a CIO, not a chief information officer, but a chief image officer. And Apple has that in, in, in their leader. Uh, Target has it in, 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 in a person. Nike has it. Uh, a handful of companies do that and do that, and do that well. But the beauty of Apple is that consistency. And whether it's in Tokyo, whether it's in, in Detroit, whether it's in New York or London, uh, everything they do uh, has that wonderful, uh, wonderful consistency. But it is manifested in part, uh, some of you I'm sure have seen the Apple Store in New York. It's about 10 minutes from where I, where I live. And it stays open 24 hours a day. And I go there at 4 in the morning because <laughs> I'm very anxious if I can't fix something on my Mac. And I don't know how to do it. So I can get to the genius bar at four in the morning. And you know, it has, again, that day-night presence, sort of similar to what uh, uh, we were looking for in, in A and W. But the thing about Apple that uh, most people uh, don't realize, a lot of architects come in and want to copy it. They say, oh, well, let's do something simple like Apple. What they don't realize is that s simplicity has many, many layers. And the main feature of, of uh, Apple, to me, is, is the Genius Bar and, and what it stands for. And if any of you, have any of you worked in an Apple store? Because they have the best training. If, you're, if you like uh, uh, computer science uh, and you get a job in an Apple store, it's like Nirvana, it goes through a six-week training program. And, uh, and then you keep moving up the ranks by how much knowledge you have. So uh, it reinforces itself. And this genius bar is uh, really of a high order. Think of any other store that has something like this. What's your experience going into a phone store to get something fixed, as an example, compared to something like this? So this, to me, is a very good benchmark. And hopefully, will segue to my being able to ask you guys some questions, but this is how I look at the creative process. Looking for clues in places you might not normally expect, using your right brain to try to push the envelope. Instead of looking at your competitors, look out, look elsewhere, and hopefully 
you will innovate and you won't die. Thank you. So.